Who did the Bible refer to as the great prostitute of Babylon? John received the revelation of Jesus Christ from God in order to reveal what must soon happen to his servants. God revealed this message to John. An angel invites John to witness the judgment of the great harlot. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me saying, come here, I will show you the judgment and the doom of the great prostitute who is seated on many waters, influencing nations. She with whom the kings of the earth have committed acts of immorality and the inhabitants of the earth have become intoxicated with the wine of her immorality. Revelation chapter 17 verses 1 through 2. We read, I will show you the judgment of the great prostitute. Right from the start, her judgment is unquestionable. There is never any doubt regarding the fate and ultimate failure of Babylon. Babylon came into being as a religious system a considerable time before Christianity did. But in satanic imitation, it anticipated the coming of the genuine Messiah. According to religious history and legend, the Babylonian religion was found by Semiramis, the wife of Nimrod, a great-grandson of Noah. She was a high priestess of idol worship. A harlot is a class of people that has existed since early societies. This is evident from the story of Rahab. In Proverbs chapter 29 verse 3, this is a type of idolatrous nations and cities. Proverbs chapter 29 verse 3. A man who loves skillful and godly wisdom makes his father joyful. But he who associates with prostitutes wastes his wealth. We read, who sits on many waters. Here, Babylon rests on many waters which translates to the fact that she rules over many different nations. Her personality is one that can be understood on a global scale. She is an international character. Babylonian religion intoxicates peoples and kings. Karl Marx argued that religion is the opiate of the masses. He was partially correct in his assessment because empty religion is the opium of the masses. We read, made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Throughout the entirety of the Bible, the concept of fornication is frequently and strongly associated with acts of idolatry. It is possible that this religious system will appear to be appealing and spiritual, though not necessarily moral. The idea around Babylon. In the Bible, the city of Babylon is mentioned a total of 287 times, making it the city that is mentioned the most after Jerusalem. On the banks of the Euphrates River, once stood the city of Babylon. In the immediate aftermath of the flood, Genesis chapter 11 verses 1 through 10 reveals that Babylon was the seed of the civilization that expressed organized hostility to God. Later on, Babylon became the capital of the empire that mercilessly conquered Judah. During that time, Judah was under its control. Babylon, to the people of God, was the essence of all evil. It was the embodiment of cruelty, lust, and greed. It was the enemy of the people of God. Those who are familiar with the Old Testament will be aware that the word Babylon is linked to organized forms of worship and blasphemy, as well as the oppression of the people of God. In John's day, Rome embodied all the resistance and antagonism to the Christian belief. The notion of Babylon predates both Revelation 17 and 18, as well as the reign of the Antichrist. Babylon as the world system has always been around, from the time of John, when Rome exemplified it, to the current day and throughout history. However, 
During the reign of the Antichrist, Babylon, in both its religious and commercial guises, will exert an influence over the world that has never been seen before. The religious Babylon is described. Revelation chapter 17 verses 3 through 6. And the angel carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. And I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was entirely covered with blasphemous names, having seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and adorned with gold, precious stones and pearls. And she was holding in her hand a gold cup full of the abominations and the filth of her sexual immorality. And on her forehead a name was written, a mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes, false religions, heresies, and of the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, God's people, and with the blood of the witnesses of Jesus who were martyred. When I saw her, I wondered in amazement. We read, He carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness. John is taken away into the wilderness. The barren nature of the wilderness makes for a fitting backdrop for a vision of judgment. We read, Sitting on a scarlet beast, this beast, which has been depicted in Revelation chapter 13 verse 1 as having seven heads and ten horns, is symbolic of the Antichrist and the rule that he will establish. The harlot rides the same beast that is mentioned in that verse. Revelation chapter 13 verse 1 And the dragon, Satan, stood on the sandy shore of the sea, then I saw a vicious beast coming up out of the sea with ten horns and seven heads. And on his horns were ten royal crowns, diadems, and on his heads were blasphemous names. The Antichrist The beast speaks blasphemies against God and aggressively oppresses the people of God wherever they may be found on earth. It not only rules the world, but receives the worship of its inhabitants. The first beast is a symbolic picture of the Antichrist, and the dragon is Satan. Note that anti in Greek means instead of, rather than against, meaning a counterfeit rather than a competitor, the man of lawlessness. His characteristics are similar to those of other fearsome beasts such as leopards, bears, and lions. The number 666 is the dictator's coded name. Her position on top of the beast shows us that she is backed by the political power of the beast. It also reveals that she is in a predominant position and at least outwardly controls and supervises the beast. Her connection with blasphemy and the dragon's beast is clearly seen from God's perspective. To the people of the world, however, she will appear to be very devout and to have the faith that they so desperately need. We then read, The woman was arrayed. The woman is clothed with emblems of governance, scarlet, and emblems of wealth, purple, gold, and precious stones. In spite of this, she engages in idolatry, abominations, as well as impurity, the filthiness of her adultery, in the midst of this luxurious setting. She was dressed in purple and scarlet. The dyes needed to manufacture fabrics in the colors purple and scarlet was difficult to come by and expensive. These colors were associated with splendor and magnificence. On her forehead, a name was written. The name on her forehead identifies her in more ways than one. It was common practice for Roman prostitutes to wear a headband that had their name etched on it. We read, Mystery, Babylon the Great. 
This title does not refer to the physical city of Babylon, but rather to the spiritual, secret representation of Babylon, which is the origin of all forms of spiritual adultery and idolatry. This harlot must encompass more territory than a single department of a religious organization. She is the personification of Satan's very own movement, which might be described as a religion of the global order. Our world is ready to be seduced by the harlot because it is built on the strong notion that it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe in something. We read, Drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. The woman not only persecutes, but she also takes pleasure in the fact that she is persecuting the godly, much like a drunk person takes pleasure in alcohol. Why was this symbol depicted as a female form? A great number of nations have given their homelands the form of a female figure. The prophets frequently portrayed the people of God as either his faithful wife when they were pure or as a prostitute when they were unfaithful. Speakers frequently expanded their points by contrasting figures. For example, we see Jerusalem portrayed as a woman in Isaiah chapter 62 verse 5. For as a young man marries a virgin, O Jerusalem, so your sons will marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so your God will rejoice over you. And we see a contrasting figure in Ezekiel chapter 16 verse 20. John is informed by the angel that all would be made clear to him regarding the harlot. Revelation chapter 17 verse 7. But the angel said to me, Why do you wonder? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which has the seven heads and ten horns. We read, I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her. The focus of the exposition is on the beast. It seemed as though this lady governed, rode the system that the Antichrist had created. But in reality, he is the driving force behind everything and is simply using her in the same way that tyrants have always used religion, as a means to achieve their goals. Revelation chapter 17 verse 9 The beast that you saw was once, but now is not. And he is about to come up out of the abyss, the bottomless pit, the dwelling place of demons, and go to destruction, perdition. And the inhabitants of the earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, will be astonished when they see the beast, because he was and is not, and is yet to come to earth. Here is the mind which has wisdom, and this is what it knows about the vision. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. We read, the seven heads are seven mountains. The city of Rome, is commonly referred to as the city on seven hills. And as a result, many people instantly connect the seven mountains with Rome. Mountains can symbolically represent nations or governments in the Bible, as seen, for example, in Daniel chapter 2, verse 35. Revelation chapter 17, verse 10. And they are seven kings, five of whom have fallen. One exists and is reigning. The other, the seventh, has not yet come. And when he does come, he must remain a little while. This seventh will very rapidly be usurped by an eighth and will become the state of the Antichrist. Revelation chapter 17, verse 11. And the beast that once was but is not is himself also an eighth king and is one of the seven, and he goes to destruction, perdition. The beast, also known as the Antichrist, can be identified without a doubt as the eighth king. 
In the sense that he has qualities with all of the prior world empires, he is one of the seven. But his demise is already predetermined. The word perdition literally translates to destruction, and that is exactly what will happen to the beast. Revelation chapter 17 verses 12 through 15. The ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom. But together, they receive authority as kings for a single hour, for a common purpose, along with the beast. These kings have one purpose, one mind, one common goal, and they give their power and authority to the beast. They will wage war against the Lamb, Christ, and the Lamb will triumph and conquer them, because He is the Lord of Lords and King of Kings, and those who are with Him and on His side are the called and chosen, elect and faithful. Then the angel said to me, The waters which you saw, where the prostitute is seated, are peoples and multitudes and nations and languages. Ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet. This probably alludes to a ten-nation confederation. Whatever their exact identity, their actions are apparent. The prostitute rules over all of the peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues in the world. This demonstrates that the harlot's impact can be felt all across the world as a result of her relationship with the beast. This will be a truly one-world religion. The meaning of the harlot is centered on her connection to the beast, namely how she is completely entwined with the beast and the government that he leads. The great harlot is judged. Antichrist's allies turn on the great harlot. Revelation chapter 17 verse 16 and the ten horns which you saw, and the beast, these will hate the prostitute, and will make her desolate and naked, stripped of her power and influence, and will eat her flesh, and completely consume her with fire. We read, These will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh, and burn her with fire. In the end, the Antichrist will not tolerate any form of worship other than that of himself. The Son of Destruction exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, to the point that he sits in the temple of God, demonstrating to himself that he is God. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verses 3 through 4 Let no one in any way deceive or entrap you, for that day will not come unless the apostasy comes first. That is, the great rebellion, the abandonment of the faith by professed Christians, and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction, the Antichrist, the one who is destined to be destroyed, who opposes and exalts himself, so proudly and so insolently, above every so-called god or object of worship, so that he actually enters and takes his seat in the temple of God, publicly proclaiming that he himself is God. We read, Burn her with fire. After the Antichrist has successfully entrenched his rule, he will no longer require the assistance of religious Babylon. After that, he will make efforts to demolish and ultimately destroy her, and her one-world religion. Tyrants' primary objective has always been to appropriate religion for their own ends and then cast it aside afterwards. In the end, everything is guided by the hand of God. Revelation chapter 17 verse 17 For God has put it in their hearts to carry out His purpose by agreeing together to surrender their kingdom to the beast, until the prophetic words of God will be fulfilled. We read, God has put it into their hearts. 
The judgment that was sent against religious Babylon was ordered by God. Sometimes, God will use one wicked group, in this case the Ten Kings, as an instrument of his judgment against another wicked group, in this case religious Babylon. This happens rather frequently in the Bible. The political support that these ten rulers would provide for the Antichrist will be ordained by God. The world will get exactly what it asks for, which is godless religion and godless government. Revelation chapter 17 verse 18 The woman whom you saw is the great city, which reigns over and dominates and controls the kings and the political leaders of the earth. Rome is said to be the great harlot in this metaphor. We read, That great city. In the days of John, there was no room for debate on which city rules over the rulers of the planet. During that era, Rome served as a political, economic, and religious focal point of the entire world. But Babylon, in the sense of the global order, has always been that great metropolis that rules over the rulers of the globe. This has been the case since the beginning of time. For Christians, the question that needs to be asked is, does it reign over me, or am I a resident of a greater city? Galatians chapter 4 verse 26 But the Jerusalem above, that is the way of faith, represented by Sarah, is free. She is our mother. Rome was the ready personification of Babylon. Idolatry is just as prevalent as it was in the past, but is now more widespread. Which city is most identifiable with the world system? Hollywood? Wall Street? Washington? The fact that the identity of the whore of Babylon is referred to as a mystery indicates that we are unable to know with absolute certainty who she is. The passage does give us some clues. To really understand the deep tyranny of Babylon, we need to delve into the details of Babylon in the Old Testament. Today, we see a lot of people challenge God. However, this seed had been planted for thousands of years. This is the story of the great cities that challenged God. It starts with the first man who created such a kingdom. The story of Nimrod and Babel is an intriguing tale that speaks to themes of ambition, pride, and the desire for unity in a way that defies the will of God. Nimrod's accounts are primarily found in the book of Genesis, specifically in chapters 10 and 11. The name Nimrod has become synonymous with being a rebel, influenced by his rebellious act against God through the building of the Tower of Babel. Nimrod is primarily known as a mighty hunter before the Lord, making him an unparalleled figure in terms of his skills and might according to Genesis chapter 10 verse 9. His hunting skills weren't just a sport. It was a sign of leadership and strength in a world that was still recovering from the Great Flood. Nimrod was a protector, a provider, and a conqueror. He was a powerful leader credited with building the city of Babylon, among others. People often connect Nimrod with the idea of civilization itself, bringing people together to live in cities rather than scattered about. The Bible tells us that his kingdom began with Babel, Erech, Akkad, and Kelmi in the land of Shinar. Genesis chapter 10 verse 10. These locations later became part of the ancient kingdom of Babylon, which plays a significant role throughout biblical history. The cities Nimrod founded continue to become great empires. The ancient city of Akkad was a major center of early civilization. Kelni is another city in the region of Shinar, though it's less known compared to the others. Babel 
Babel is often thought to be the same as Babylon. In fact, some Bible translations actually list this city as Babel rather than Babylon. After the flood, people began to settle and grow in number. Before the tower's construction, the people spoke one language and had a united purpose. The people who settled in Shinar are the ones who attempted to build the Tower of Babel, as told in Genesis chapter 11 verses 1 through 9. God wasn't too happy about this and confused their languages, scattering them over the earth. Their intent was to achieve unity, but not under God's terms. They wanted to build a tower to reach heaven, which was a direct defiance of God's plan for them to multiply and spread across the earth. The tower served as a guide to them. It was a symbol of what people could achieve and how smart they were. So, the tower was left incomplete, a leftover from when people thought they could reach the sky, but were reminded they couldn't escape their human limits. But this is not the end of Babylon, as we have seen. Jeremiah can be referred to as a prophet to the nations. He now addresses Babylon in particular. It is a forecast, a prophecy, of Babylon's and the world's demise. God declares war on both Babylon and the gods of Babylon. Babel Babylon is a symbol of rebellion against God the earthly city of human splendor opposing the heavenly city that glorifies God. Ancient Babylon was a famous city that was situated in the region of Mesopotamia that is now known as Iraq. It is used throughout the Bible as a metaphor for human arrogance, disobedience, and the worship of false gods. The Bible doesn't give us a ton of details about what Babylon was like before the reign of Nimrod, but it does provide some interesting points for consideration. Babylon was part of the land of Shinar, which is where people settled after Noah's Ark came to rest and the waters of the flood receded. Babylon, in the Bible, was a place where many people, including the Israelites, were taken and made to live far from home. When Babylon defeated a city called Jerusalem, they didn't just take the land, they also took away many smart and skilled people from Judah. Nebuchadnezzar at this time was the king of Babylon. One day, his army went to Judah and conquered it. The Fall of Babylon Belshazzar succeeded Nebuchadnezzar as king many years later. One night, during a big party, Belshazzar and his high-ranking friends were disrespectfully using special cups and plates they had stolen from a holy temple in Jerusalem. At some point during the festivities, a phantom hand appeared and scribbled on the palace wall. The events of Daniel 5 occurred in 539 BC, the year, the very night in fact, that the great Babylonian kingdom founded by Nebuchadnezzar fell to a coalition from the Medes and the Persians. According to Daniel, the problem was that Belshazzar knew all this, yet still refused to repent and be humble. Belshazzar exalted himself against the Lord and worshipped inanimate objects rather than the God who gave him existence and breath. So, rather than repenting of the very things that had gotten his predecessor into trouble, he simply shook his fist in the face of God. Just as Babylon had been God's tool to chasten Judah, so the invaders, Cyrus with the Medes and Persians, and later Alexander with his Greek army, would be God's weapon to defeat Babylon. God spoke to the invading armies and commanded them to get their weapons ready and shout for victory because they would win the battle. This was no ordinary war. This was the vengeance of the Lord. The Lord was in command of the invasion and his orders were to be carried out explicitly. Babylon the hammer was itself shattered. 
Babylon was caught in God's trap and couldn't escape God's weapons. Their young men would be executed like cattle, for the day of judgment for Babylon had come. God gathers the armies against Babylon. This report paralyzed the king of Babylon. Like a hungry lion looking for prey, Cyrus and then Alexander would attack Babylon, and nobody would be able to resist. God's chosen servant will always succeed. When Babylon was in God's hands, it was like a wine cup, making the nations act like drunks. Now, however, the cup would be shattered, and Babylon's power would be destroyed. God, however, made it clear that there was no future in Babylon, for he had determined to destroy the city. If his people remained in Babylon, they would suffer the city's fate. The Bible frequently portrays cities in a negative light. The initial reference, which is usually crucial, links them to Lamech's land of weaponry and the production of mass destructive weapons. They concentrate people, and hence sinners, and thus sin. Greed and pride are the two sins that are highlighted in this passage. Both are linked to money's idolatry, because it is impossible to worship both God and mammon at the same time. In the meantime, Israel's King David had built Jerusalem as his capital. It was not in a strategic location for trade, because it was not near the sea, a large river, or a significant road. It was, nevertheless, the city of God, the site where he chose to live among his people, at first in the ten Moses assembled, later in the temple Solomon built. As predicted, that horrible city deteriorated into a dismal heap of debris, completely deserted except by desert wild animals. The fact that the books of Daniel and Revelation have so many parallels is no coincidence. Both books contain end-of-the-world visions that are very similar. After the prostitute falls, Babylon follows suit. The Fall of Commercial Babylon Revelation chapter 18 verses 1 through 3 After these things, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, possessing great authority, and the earth was illuminated with his splendor and radiance. And he shouted with a mighty voice, saying, Fallen, fallen, certainly to be destroyed as Babylon the Great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a dungeon haunted by every unclean spirit and a prison for every unclean and loathsome bird. For all the nations have drunk from the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings and political leaders of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have become rich by the wealth and economic power of her sensuous luxury. Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen. He proclaims that Babylon has fallen, fallen, and the word is repeated like a solemn dirge of the damned. We read, Become a dwelling place of demons. A tragic end for a city that was once of immense importance. The sin of Babylon consisted not only of idolatry, often known as immorality, but also of vanity, greed, and the hoarding of wealth for one's own benefit. Lament for Commercial Babylon Revelation chapter 18 verses 9 through 10 And the kings and political leaders of the earth, who committed immorality and lived luxuriously with her, will weep and beat their chests in mourning over her, when they see the smoke of her burning, standing a long way off, in fear of her torment, saying, Woe, woe, the great city, the strong city Babylon! In a single hour your judgment has come. We read, Standing at distance for fear of her torment. 
These kings are forced to keep their distance, since the heat and smoke produced by her burning are so intense. Some people have the opinion that this may perhaps be a hint of nuclear weapons. Babylon is now desolate and without any influence. Revelation chapter 18 verses 22 through 23. And the sound of harpists and musicians and flutists and trumpeters will never again be heard in you, and no skilled artisan of any craft will ever again be found in you. And the sound of the millstone, grinding grain, will never again be heard in you. For commerce will no longer flourish, and normal life will cease. And never again will the light of a lamp shine in you, and never again will the voice of the bridegroom and bride be heard in you. For your merchants were the great and prominent men of the earth, because all the nations were deceived and misled by your sorcery your magic spells, and poisonous charm. John uses imagery and poetic language to explain the impending doom that will befall Babylon's manufacturing and commercial sectors. But Babylon is doomed. She and they will fall. Their days will be numbered. The incredible manner in which this is accomplished is absolutely plausible in today's environment. Ambitious politicians, hungry for power, resent this financial clout. They are even prepared to bring about economic disaster if that will enable them to take over. The kings will be jealous of the woman who rides them and will resolve to destroy her. The city will be engulfed in flames. It will be the world's worst economic disaster in history. Many. Many people will weep and mourn over the ruins. The disaster will have been brought about by God, not by any physical action. He will have instilled in their hearts the desire to fulfill His mission. He'll have persuaded them to join forces with the beast to fight the city. The Antichrist will have political authority and the false prophet religious control. The kings will now offer them economic control in return for delegated powers for themselves. But their possession of such privileges will be extremely short. One hour. Babylon's demise is so certain that it is depicted in Revelation as having already occurred. This is something Christians can be assured of. However, there are practical reasons for informing them. What is the connection between God's people and this final Babylon? There are three rules to follow. First, there will be many martyrs in the city. The whore is drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. This last phrase again indicates the presence of Christians and occurs throughout Revelation. In a city devoted to immorality, pious people have no place. A conscience is something that the community does not desire. Second, Christians are instructed to come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins, so that you will not receive any of her plagues, for her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Revelation chapter 18 verses 4 through 5 and I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not be a partner in her sins and receive her plagues. For her sins, crimes, transgressions, have piled up as high as heaven, and God has remembered her wickedness and crimes for judgment. Why Babylon Matters to Us Babylon's story teaches us that being too proud can get us into trouble, and it's important to be humble. It teaches us that however mighty or ambitious we may be, our plans must align with God's will. When they don't, the results can be undesirable. The story of Babylon is that of caution. It warns us against the dangers of pride and self-reliance, 
urging us to depend on God instead. It also speaks to the folly of human efforts to achieve unity or immortality outside of God's plan. Whether as a community or as individuals, the story reminds us that our ambitions should be aligned with God's will. Otherwise, like the people of Babylon, we risk finding ourselves working against God's purposes, and that can only lead to confusion and ultimately to our downfall. So, the next time you find yourself striving to build a tower, take a moment to consider whether your ambitions align with God's plan for you. Remember, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Psalm chapter 127 verse 1. Prophets like Isaiah and Jeremiah foretold Babylon's fall due to its injustices, idolatry, and immorality. Therefore, as individuals or as a society, our actions have consequences. Oppressing others, disregarding morality, and turning away from what's right can lead to downfall. We also see that earthly kingdoms are temporary. Despite its might and grandeur, Babylon eventually fell to the Medo Persian Empire, just as it was foretold. In other words, everything on earth is temporary from our own successes to the way society is built. The only thing that will last forever is God's kingdom. So, focus on what will last forever, not just on what is here today and gone tomorrow. The story of Babylon getting powerful and then falling apart shows us that God tries to communicate with us in many ways and we should pay attention and not be too proud. Babylon was an amazing place made by people, but it fell apart because God wanted it to. This story is always important because it reminds us that real power and greatness belong to God. Like it says in the Bible, God's rule is forever, and it will always be there for all generations. Daniel chapter 4 verse 34 The Emergence of Another Woman The Bride So Revelation 21 through 22 refers to the New Jerusalem city as the Bride of the Lamb because it is the place that both Israel and the church dwell with God in perfect harmony. In that sense, the city personifies the people in the same way that the Old Testament uses Jerusalem to personify Israel, or Sodom to personify the ungodly. Some of the visions in Revelation chapters 18 through 22 refer to a marriage between the Lamb and His bride. We know that the Lamb is Christ, Revelation chapter 4 verses 6 through 10. But who is the bride, the Lamb's wife? The bride, the Lamb's wife, is identified by observing what is said about her in the bride and the bridegroom passages. The separation of the two opposed spiritual kingdoms, Satan's and Christ's, is signified by the rejoicing of the multitude in heaven at the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is in contrast to the wicked city, in which the voice of the bride and bridegroom is no longer heard. Revelation chapter 18 verse 23 so we understand that the Bride of Christ is a figure of His kingdom, or called out people which He, the Lamb, purchased with His own blood. Revelation chapter 5 verses 9 through 10. Within a lengthy lament over the wicked Babylon, we notice this significant statement. And the voice of the Bridegroom and the Bride will no longer be heard in you. The Bride's Raiment Revelation chapter 19 verses 7 through 9. Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. And to her it was granted to be arrayed in fine linen, clean and bright. For the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. 
Then he said to me, Write, Blessed are those who were called to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true sayings of God. The bride's clothing of fine linen, clean and bright, represents the righteous acts of the saints or holy people. It follows sensibly that the bride herself is a figure for those very saints who do the righteous acts through faith in the Lamb, and who together make up the church of the Lamb, the church he makes holy and righteous by his own blood. By contrast, in the next vision, a multitude in heaven sings, Let us rejoice and be glad, and give glory to God Almighty, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Verse 8 describes the bride's dress, as any decent report of a wedding would do. She was given fine linen in which to clothe herself, linen bright and clean. The Bride's Like Sign The bride, the Lamb's wife, is shown to John, but he sees the New Jerusalem. The Bride of Christ and the New Jerusalem signify the same thing. Revelation chapter 21 verses 2 through 4 And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among the people, and he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself will be among them, and he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death, there will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain, the first things have passed away. This Jerusalem is the one that gives us hope, the Jerusalem that is in the heavens, and the location of our true citizenship. Hebrews chapter 12 verse 22 But you have come to Mount Zion, and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels. Holy and new are two defining characteristics of the city. It is not comparable to any city on earth due to the fact that it is both sacred and brand new. The city's name, Jerusalem, provides a sense of continuity with the earth, particularly with the place of our redemption. It is important to note the significance of referring to this wonderful dwelling place of God and His people as the Holy City. The consummation of the Christian hope is supremely social. What distinguishes the New Jerusalem from the Old is that there are no more tears, no more sorrows, no more deaths, and no more agony. In the future, it will be demonstrated that the New Jerusalem does not have a temple, does not perform sacrifices, does not have a sun or moon, does not experience nighttime, sin, or abomination. The Hebrew writer says, You have come to Mount Zion, to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to myriads of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are enrolled in heaven. The destiny of the saints of all ages, Hebrews chapter 12 verses 22 through 24, and the angels of heaven, is to be welcomed into that church when he takes her into heaven. At the end of the passage, the angel says to John, Come, I will show you the bride, the Lamb's wife. Revelation chapter 21 verse 9. John is then swept away to be shown the holy city, Jerusalem. You should have gathered that the Bride of Christ and the New Jerusalem both represent the same thing, because the angel said he would show John the Bride of Christ, yet he showed him the New Jerusalem. All things new. Revelation chapter 21 verse 5 And he who sits on the throne said, Behold, 
I am making all things new. And he said, Right, for these words are faithful and true. This is a quick look at the thinking behind God's eternal plan. To allow sin and its destruction, in order to do a greater work of making all things new. At this stage in his plan for the ages, the plan has been executed in its entirety. Everything is brand new. Revelation chapter 21 verses 9 through 10. The city is portrayed as the bride to impress upon us the city's incredible beauty. This is a departure from Babylon and the woman in Babylon. What will it be like? Revelation chapter 22 verses 3 through 5 There will no longer be any curse, and the throne of God and of the Lamb will be in it, and His bondservants will serve Him. They will see His face, and His name will be on their foreheads. And there will no longer be any night, and they will not have need of the light of a lamp nor the light of the sun, because the Lord God will illuminate them, and they will reign forever and ever. Heaven is going to be a place where the darkness of this age is finally and completely eradicated for good. The light does not come from an artificial source, not even the sun. Rather, the light comes from God Himself. Heaven will be a realm where God's people can rule for all of eternity, in contrast to the millennium, which will only last for a finite amount of time. It will go on indefinitely. We see the return of paradise. The Bride's Mission Revelation chapter 22, verse 17 and the Spirit and the Bride say, Come, and let him who hears say, Come, and let him who thirsts come. Whoever desires, let him take the water of life freely. The Bride of Christ joins in sending out the invitation to the marriage supper of the Lamb and to drink the water of life.